Welcome back, everyone. It is that time of the month. It is book club with big gay energy. <laughs> I know where all your brains went and get them out of the gutter. Because <laughs> today we're going to talk about the awesome book, Honey Girl by Morgan Rogers. And it's quite the thrill. But before we get into that, we have some lovely supporters to recognize. Yes, we do. So we have some Patreon supporters and someone who donates monthly on Anchor. So our December Patreon supporters are Sandy, Cece, Haley, Frida, Lorena, Sawyer, and Sapphire L. And Anchor is Kathleen. Yay! Woo-woo! Yes, very exciting. Now we have another month because we had to skip a month for book club. We sure did. So January. January, we, our supporters are Each Owl, Frida, Sapphire L, Lorena, Sawyer, and Sandy, and Kathleen. Thank Thank you, you guys. guys. You're all amazing. And you allow us to do even more. And we're going to grow so much. And then we're going to put on like, huge events and then save bookstores and save the world world domination Woo! thank you so that's where your support is going can i have more coffee before we do that yeah yeah we're gonna we're gonna open a big gay energy coffee shop (gasps) oh we should so do that oh lord you heard it here first folks it's because of your lovely support Sweet lesbian Jesus. I mean, that's just. I mean, just coffee and relevant. book club. It makes sense, right? And energy, and like that. <laughs> yes, you're right. Bristol, right. shut up. Sorry. Yeah, Bristol. Bristol wants to get into Honey Girl, so let's get into Honey Girl. So, what is Honey Girl? Well, according to the back of the book, <laughs> actually, this is a bad. I just, I can't transition into this, so I'm just gonna read it. With her newly completed PhD in astronomy in hand, Grace Porter goes on a girl's trip to Vegas to celebrate. She's a straight A, hardworking, high achiever. She is not the kind of person who goes to Vegas and gets drunkenly married to a woman whose name she doesn't know. Until she does exactly that. This one beautiful, spontaneous moment upends Grace's carefully laid life plans. Staggering under the weight of her parents' expectation, a struggling job market, and feelings of burnout, Grace flees her home in Portland for a summer in New York with the wife she barely knows. In New York, she's able to ignore all the constant questions about her future and falls hard for her creative and gorgeous wife, Yuki Yamamoto. But when reality comes crashing in, Grace must face what she's been running from all along, the fears that make us human and the need for connection especially when navigating the messiness of adulthood. I love this book. I have two comments. Go sure. for it. One, Theora should do an audio book. Two, you. all of that's on the back of the book. Yes, it yes, is. It sure is. I have a comment. Of Morgan, isn't he cute? Morgan! Morgan! Woo! All right. I have a comment as well. All right. I read the synopsis that you just gave us, and I was like, hmm, well, you know, I could could like this. Oh, you know, it's book club, so I have to read it. And then when I did read it, it turned out to be my new favorite book ever in the world, and I want to hug Morgan Rogers for writing it. If she likes that kind of thing. Fun fact. Brie has been like, I can't wait to talk about this book. Can we talk about the book now? Can we We did this a week early, okay, from our normal recording. The anticipation, this guys. This book is so freaking good. It's really good. Morgan, come talk to us, please. please yes, please. Love. I need this, to pick your brain. This was her breakout novel, too. Just FYI. And it's a very powerful, incredible, like, first, like, big mainstream novel and she deserves all the credit for writing this wonderful wonderful book if you've (laughs) ever felt lonely in your life you will find something so beautiful in this book 
Yeah, if you're in your 20s and 30s in this economy, you will relate <laughs> with this book. <laughs> Just why we're talking about it. All right. If you so, are a person of color, you will. <laughs> yeah, like and a queer this person. Book. The representation is off the charts. A queer person of color. <laughs> it's off the charts. So let's dive into the characters, the cast of characters in this book. So first up, we have Dr. Grace Porter. She is our protagonist. The book is written from her point of view. She is a biracial 28-year-old lesbian. And as the synopsis said, she, at the point where we meet her in the book, she just achieved her PhD in astronomy. And now after attaining that, she's looking for her first big job and finding out her life is not exactly what she planned it to be. And that's Grace in a nutshell. And she just goes on a journey after that for the rest of the book. Carol and Sharon. All right. Next up is uh, Colonel and Sharon. So Grace's <laughs> father is uh, Colonel Porter. We'll get into all that later. And Sharon is her stepmother. Then we have the wifey, Yuki Yamamoto. So she's Grace's love interest that they drunkenly get married in Las Vegas, as the synopsis said. And she lives in New York City. We have Grace's best friends, which are Agnes and Yemena, who pop up throughout the book. Then we have Grace's found family, which is an actual family. So Mira and Raj, who are brother and sister, and their father, Baba Vihan. And Grace also works at their tea shop in Portland. We also have another found family, which is Yuki's roommates in New York City. So that's uh, San Sani, Dorian, and Fletcher. And lastly, we have Grace's mother and her boyfriend slash fiance, uh, so Mel and Kelly. And those are the main characters really in this book. So they all really center around Grace and people she either knew her whole life found when she was in Portland or finds through Yuki and they all kind of interconnect through Grace. Dorian, not to be confused with Durian. He's not no. a <laughs> he's not a fruit <laughs> in Asia, no. Dorian, like the painting. That's a painting. Of Dorian well, Gray. It's Dorian Gray, it's a novel. Um, there is a painting. Spoiler Oscar in the Wild. book. Oscar Wilde. Also a great queer author, Oscar Wilde. Yes. <gasps> really? Yes. Yeah. Didn't really. Of classics. Yeah. Oh, wait. You can keep going. going. You... Any comments about any of the characters or you want to just dive into the questions? I love them all. I cannot. I just love them all. Can I, can I just have coffee with all of them separately? Or tea at the the pearl pearl room. Tea. Can I go? Yeah, I want to go to the I tea love shop. Sandwiches. The I thought sandwich you were going to say something about the characters, and she's like, "I love sandwiches." <laughs> yeah, it went somewhere I wasn't expecting. <laughs> and the, I'm here for the enthusiasm. The little treats. Me too. <laughs> treats. I like food. Yeah. Hell yeah. Um, I they keep talking about. I. What I. I loved the contrast with Grace and Yugi as far as so you got Grace who's just got her PhD and is trying to get into the best job in the best you know just the best company <laughs> the best period it doesn't matter what it is yeah. it just has to be the best but then you've got Yuki who's a waitress and has a radio show and she doesn't really she's fine with that like that's just her life you know yeah Yuki's like aside from like the loneliness aspect that we'll dive into she's ha she's happy with her life because she's like gets to do what she loves which is the radio show and then she has her f like f she's surrounded by her friends who are her family so like she's like I'm happy like yep. you know and Grace doesn't really know what happiness is which is part of the problem happiness was is dad the colonel's approval and that's where this whole spiraling from grace comes from and the Happiness tension is not between her and juicy <clears throat> to great what well, doesn't register on her radar yeah happiness like something just for her happiness yeah. is part of her self-discovery in the in the book yeah 
I like Agnes and Jimena. Is that, yeah. that's how you say it? They're right? cool. Jimena, yeah. I like that even though Agnes had like a lot of issues mentally and stuff, that they still like loved her and wanted her to be around them. And just yeah. That's it's hard important. a lot of times. It's important for people to just to people for people to accept you and it's hard when you have the stigma of mental illness. Yeah, it's, it's like if you have a mental illness a lot of times other people think you're too much to be around. And if you have people that actually support you and help you get through it, then you can actually have a better life. Like you two. With me. I think we all we're all. I think we're all. <laughs> we all co-defendant now. Yeah, we all co-defendant. We all co-defendant. <laughs> We're Let's stuck together. If you marry one of us, you marry all of us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you should tell Julie that. Julie, oh, I will. <laughs> Julie got, Julie got a personal listening. letter for Christmas saying that. So, <laughs> I'll I will um, text Julie later. <laughs> Hold on, I'm trying to find something. We can cut this out. Let's see if we can find it. I highlighted first met basically like the glue of their whole family, their little group is really Yumena. And she had this line in there in the book where she's describing there's a whole chapter about like how Grace met Yumena because Yumena is basically like a sitter at a hospital. And she like there's not a nurse, it's kinda of, I don't even know if it's like a nurse's aide, but basically like she sits with people who are like kind of stuck in the hospital. So they and give them company so they don't get depressed because honestly being a patient in a hospital sometimes where you're just like waiting for something to like get out of there when you're otherwise stable and okay it can cause like depression and stuff because you're like trapped in the hospital so she's a type of person that sits with patients to like provide them comfort and like she's give a them companion company. yeah like a companion exactly exactly and so she was the colonel's companion that's how grace kind of met her and then they become roommates. And then the day she met Agnes is, is an interesting day. So she got us, Yemena got assigned to a psych ward, the psych unit or whatever in the hospital, and basically was talking about Agnes. And the way she described her to Grace, it was kind of like she says something like, When I met her, it's the same feeling I had when I met you. Like I felt like that person's mine. Like she, like Yemena describes it as like, I had this instant kind of connection with Agnes and Grace, like immediately. And like, so she's like, I'm not going to give up on her, even though, like, like you said, like, there's a stigma with, like, the mental illness. And, like, she seemed like uh, she's an abrasive person. Like, you kind of get that she's very blunt. She has wa emotional walls up. But you meant as somebody who's like, no, there's something here. We have a connection. I feel it. I'm not going to give up on you. And that's, like, the core of who you meant it is. And that's a very, like, important character in a friend group to have that kind of person who's very, like. The glue. Just, She's like the mom too, like Heart. like a like a fierce mom who's like not gonna let anybody hurt her like babies and stuff. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's so I love that that like she even expl that's explained in the book, kind of like how you meta views Agnes because it's not what you normally hear as a narrative with a character like Agnes. Yeah, exactly. I really liked it. Yeah, it's great. I also really loved Raj's. I love Raj and the way that he and uh, Grace had that conversation later in the book. I th thought it was like a super important about moment. the tea room and yeah, yeah, he's... yeah. Raj is just like he's taking one for the team, big time. Yeah, I mean, dedicating to his life to something to make his family happy, and he knows that he's going to be miserable. I feel like sooner or later that's gonna come back. Like, yeah, but not in the book. Maybe another one. <laughs> Part two, <laughs> honeyer girl, <laughs> honey boy, or honey boy. Um, <laughs> it could be about it. Could you know? You never know. They could write a book never about know. Sonny. No, I'm saying. All right. Okay. So let's jump into. I have a couple questions for you guys. Uh, so that our listeners at home can get a little uh, deeper into this book. So first question, 
what is your assessment of Grace's life not panning out according to her big perfect plan? It was bound to happen. <laughs> uh, I agree it was inevitable. The plan was supposed to work and it didn't. And that was the only thing that she had been working towards for many, many years. And now she's at a point where she has no idea how to move forward and she's lost. So, I mean, it's like she's when everyone tells her, including the colonel, that it's going to be hard to make her make a place for herself as a woman in color in astronomy. And she knows that, but the reality of it is so much more is so much different than knowing. So you can know something going into it, but once you get there and the reality hits you and people are saying things to you that are very um stupid, racist, bullshit that kind of stuff it, it hits you it, it has to hit you and you're like okay well I didn't know how this was actually going to affect me because you don't you don't know how things are going to affect you until you're in the moment so I really feel for Grace because she was basically driven in this direction by the colonel and took on that part of his personality for her own so it made it made her lose part of her identity in the process. And so she's going in this direction without her true self at the center. And so she's obviously going to come to a spot where things don't work out and everything spins out of control. And I think that's what the book is. And that is beautiful because that happens to everyone in some way, shape or form. You get to a point where you have to figure out what your actual identity is. Well, the and colonel was beautiful. <laughs> the colonel was uh, pushing her with one plan. She was always working for one thing, one thing only. She didn't see anything else. So, anything that changes, she's not going to handle that well. So that's basically everything was changing because she didn't get um, the job that she was trained for, basically. Like, it was lined up, and her personal life also just changed because she got married randomly. So she just spiraled because it was just too much. Yeah. I'm going to read a quote from the book that I think falls into this really, really, really well about this whole journey <clears throat> it's in the beginning of chapter seven if to those so inclined the younger grace porter tilted her head up up there you see where the stars drew a path and the comet fire lit the way that was where she found her purpose she fell in love with the stars and she was going to follow where they led now she's 28 years old and she's reached the comet's end there is just grace with a piece of paper to prove her academic merit and uncertainty eating at her insides like a black hole. No one told her astronomers, the ones that published research every few months and get tenured at universities and navigate programs at NASA, that those astronomers didn't have sun gold hair. They don't have sun brown skin. Those astronomers don't have ancestors that looked at the stars as a means of escape and not in awe. What's important about this plan, too, is that, yeah, it was the colonel's plan, but it, it really wasn't. He wanted her to go to med school. Mm -hmm. And Grace was inserting her personality into the plan by saying, no, I want to go after astronomy because, like, I love it. It's my passion. But it's a passion that kind of fits the colonel's plan where she's like, well, I'll just get a doctorate in this versus a medical doctorate. Because, like, that way I'm achieving the highest level of academia and in your plan that's being the best at what i i'm you're technically when you reach a doctorate you're an expert in your field so like that's the highest achievement you can get academically so grace is like yeah i'm gonna do your plan but i'm gonna do my version of the plan so like it's a tiny little rebellion from grace and then when we meet her i like to call the point of this the, this book the millennial quarter life crisis because this happened to me where it's like i'm almost 30 
And my life is not what I thought it was going to be. And Grace's whole thing was like, I followed the plan. Like I achieved every single thing that was on the plan. And then the next step is to just get the job. And the jobs that she's describing is like, again, like elite jobs, being somebody who's a tenured academic, like there's like a handful of people that achieve that. Working at NASA, a handful of people achieve that. So like, she's not just going after a job in her field. She's trying to go after like the highest possible job in her field. So like, she's setting her expectations extremely high because that's what her father told her success is. And success is how she gets affection from him. So it's that toxic tethering of like, you get love from me when you achieve things I want you to achieve kind of stuff. And so like, she's setting herself up for failure by like, right out of school trying to get like the highest level job possible. And then when she goes to the interview, it's this reality thing of just like, nobody even looks like me here. They're looking at me weird. They're grilling me more than they normally would grill. So she gets this sense that like, I don't belong here. And they're looking for any excuse not to let me in their like, in their circle, because it's a small group of people at the end of the day. And so with that, Grace is like, I don't know what to do, because my plan was to achieve this. And now, like, there's, do I even belong here? Do I even want this? So like, like you said, Brie, like it's it's one thing to like have a plan. Like I ha- I went through this too when I was graduating college. Like I had a plan for what I was going to do. And then I started working in the field and I was like, I hate this. I don't know that I want to dedicate four years of grad school to like achieve this thing. I don't even think I belong here. So then you have to figure out, well, now what? Who am I? What do I want? And what Grace wants was never something she was allowed to have. It was always like, how do I make my dad happy? So Grace has to spiral with, what do I do next? And like, do I try to get back on this plan my dad wanted for me? Or do I like forge my own path? And like, what does that even look like? Yeah. I like that you pointed out the millennial quarter life crisis because as an elder millennial, I concur. Yeah. It's it's happened to a lot of people, you know? Well, I mean, I was in the same kind of position and like got to this got got to clinicals and internship and was like I this is not for me I do not like this this is making me crazy and feel like I am this is not crazy it's making me feel like I'm trying to fit myself into something that is that I don't even like the culture of. So I pushed myself past that and I'm proud of myself for finishing. But at the same time, I know that it's not meant, you know, I'm not in a place where I'm meant to be forever. So I needed the experience, I think, but then I was lost for like, and just stuck doing the same thing over and over again. It's like, and it's not like it's a job that doesn't take a lot out of you because I mean, I stand like yesterday when I got out of work, I was so exhausted because my job means I have to pay attention every single second that I am scrubbed into a case because somebody's life depends on me paying attention or can depend on me paying attention to every little thing. So is that because in my head, I'm like, huh, way back in the day, it's a cool job. Like, I'm going to be cool like Grey's Anatomy. Guess what? It's a very draining job. And if you're not meant to be in surgery in some on some level, you won't make it. So I get exactly I get part of her journey in that because she got to that point. And then she's like, I don't even want to work for these people. I don't, you know, like, what am I doing here? And that's another reason I identify with Grace so much. Yeah, and I identify with her putting her personal life on hold piece because in order to go into, like, she says multiple lines in there where she's like, free time, (laughs) free time. My free time is trying to cram words into my brain because all I'm doing is studying. Like, I remember going through like college and having roommates that were just like hanging out doing whatever but I was like 
nose deep in organic chemistry books. And I'm like, I don't have time for this. And like, I work and like, so I understand what Grace is went through to like do school where you're, you have a job plus you're trying to like achieve, like go into like STEM stuff and it's exhausting. So you can't really blame Grace for like going crazy when she finally has a moment to breathe and she like gets drunk and does something reckless because she was never afforded that she couldn't she couldn't step out of line like in order to get a doctorate and work like she had to dedicate every single second of her life to that so like you don't have a personal life like she's lucky she has friends that like are even there because even finding that is very challenging when you're just so singularly focused on one thing that like requires everything you have to achieve for years and so like that's why it's like the quarter life crisis. Cause you kind of, you come out of that and you finally get a chance to breathe where you don't have to study 24 seven. And like, you're like, well now what, who, who even am I? Like, I just like sacrificed years of my life to get here. And I don't even know who I am anymore. Cause like who I was, was just like somebody who studied. Now I'm like, I don't know how to be a person. Cause what does that mean for me now? So it's, it's, it's a very jarring thing. And like, plus she didn't get the job. So it's like, all, like literally everything is crumbling like she's like i who am i is really the big question in the yeah. with grace when we first meet her i'm getting stressed out with every sentence that you guys say why why i don't know i just i feel like i'm heading there soon. is it because you're picking up our feelings of the past probably probably you're yeah, heading into well. your quarter life yeah <laughs> see i didn't do the whole ignore this i I did have to ignore the social life, but I did also go through a terrible breakup in the middle of clinicals. So, nice. yeah, I'm just uh, life's rough. It it's hard sometimes. to know what you want to do. Like the in between of, I really hate this, and what yeah. am I even good at? Yeah. yeah. This is it's the crazy crisis. It's crazy that we're so supposed to make that. I'm in it. <laughs> I think you are in it, Caitlin. Okay. Yeah, and it's rough. And there's no, the thing is, there's no right answer. And it just, you got to figure out what's best for you, honestly. And know you. The so time of reflection. First thing that I wrote for this question was, how do they expect people to pick what they want to do for the rest of their lives in high school? Based Thank off you. like that career test, you know, like how they make you do career tests and stuff. We never like, did that. We didn't only, either. I've only oh. seen it on TV. Same. I'm a baby. Um, we had to do college like readiness in school, so we had to do career things, a uh, personality test, resume. Resume? Did we do resume? Yeah, we had a bunch of shit. Um, yeah. So I think. There are some people who got fast food worker. Yeah, which is not bad. It's just, I, oh God, I'm really stressed. I'm kind of, I'm starting to be in an in-between right now. So I think I'm currently in it. I'm yeah. just not as Yeah, <laughs> yep. but, but it works out in the end. It just takes some time and it sucks going through it. Just like. Grace's journey. Just no, you're not. Yeah, alone. Uh, I'm gonna spiral later, but I'll, you'll get messages. All right, continue. <laughs> so, question number two. Let's move on before Caitlin spirals. All right. Throughout the book, Grace goes by different nicknames. Uh, like Yuki calls her Honey Girl. Her father calls her Porter. Mira calls her Space Girl. Baba Vihan calls her Gracie. What do you think these nicknames indicate about how Grace is perceived by her friend and family? Okay, I made notes. Do it. Okay, so. Cheers. Oh, look, I got the tornado. Okay. Caffeinating right. for non-binary Jesus. I think RBG would be into this. RBG so. would totally be into this. Okay, so. Honey girl, Yuki's term of endearment shows you how Yuki thinks of Grace, the woman blessed by the sun. Yuki is lost in the darkness. Grace is the sun. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Porter. It's a professional name. Like in the military, I was on ROTC. They call you by your last name. That's just how it is. 
most of the time, unless they have a nickname that you hate. <laughs> um, Facts. It also creates distance while still being familiar. So there's a distance to that saying someone's last name as a name for them if you're using it in the way that it's used by the colonel and also, you know, other people like the one who's the receptionist that hates Grace and vice versa. Oh, I forget her name, but yeah, the the colonel's receptionist. Exactly. Yeah, does that too, yeah. Yeah, so it's just, it's the creates the distance. It gives you an idea that these characters, even though they're family, there's like at arm's length, he keeps her at arm's length in a way. Yeah, I think well, to him, it, it's twofold. He's showing that by using that nickname that he views her as an extension of himself mm -hmm. versus like. Yep, exactly. Yeah, as an extension of himself. And then also, to your point in the army, it's more so about a respect versus affection. Yes. And respect is earned. Hence why, like, her, him respecting her is very tethered to her achieving stuff. It's like military culture that he it brings is. home to his daughter, basically. Um, Space Girl shows how smart she is and it, how where she is in relation to where Mira is and how Mira looks up to her. It's also just an acute affectionate. I think it's a beautiful contrast with the dad be or with mm -hmm. Colonel because it also shows that like, because they say things like, oh, you're, you have your head in the stars. Like also like mm -hmm. Grace is a bit of a dreamer too. Like it, that's part mm -hmm. of her personality. She's not just like the like soldier. She's not just soldier science girl. Yeah. And head in the clouds too. It's like somebody who's, ambitious too like that's part of who grace is and she's dependable to them so it, it's like they mira is like basically giving her this nickname based off of like her personality mm -hmm. not like her status in the family kind of the way the dad does yes yeah so it's more like personality language and the dad's is very like sterile clinical term that he gives his daughter just porter you know it's very it, it shows a lot about the dynamic it already sets up the dynamics right with grace and her father versus like her friend groups based on what they call her which i find very interesting in the book mm -hmm. there are several points at which grace talks about astronomy and how her mentor approached teaching astronomy as an art not just a science of things in the sky so to her the space, the stars, everything is an art form in a way. It, it, not an art form, but it is art in itself. And also just, you, you know, there's countless things about how beautiful space in the universe outside of Earth is. So that also is a thing that I loved because I love astronomy for not... I took astronomy purposefully as my, as one of my electives just because of the way that I loved space and it is romantic in a way. There's a romantic, there's a lot of romance in space, but if you just take it down to a science, the scientific parts of it, people like to kind of remove that. And I think it's a shame. So yay for that professor. Um, and then Gracie, the affectionate term from Baba, shows that she's part of the family and that he's she's just one of his kids. Yeah, like it's like the nickname you he would give his own daughter, and it's like mm -hmm. a young girl, like an innocent, like she's innocent to him, like Gracie, yep. like my young girl kind of thing versus Porter. Yep. Yeah. So it, it again, it shows like how Mira's family really views her as like actual family even the father has a nickname for her that's like mm -hmm. a endearing actually affectionate nickname you'd give a fam like a young family member like a daughter kind of thing precisely so she got caitlin i feel like i did this a little wrong there's no wrong way to do it what she got my notes are it's what they know her as honey girl yuki only remembered her hair 
reporter, her dad saw her as his charge. Space girl, Mira listens to her talk about astronomy. Racy, Baba saw her as a kid and part of the family. No, you got it. You nailed it. They all saw her different ways, which I feel could have contributed to her loneliness Mm because no one saw all of her. Oh, amazing point, Kaylee. That's an amazing point. (laughs) Damn. I didn't think about that. (laughs) You're right. Caitlin just like, what the hell? (laughs) Everyone who's watching this on YouTube, put. Go Caitlin in the comments because holy <laughs> shit and the mind blowing. Yeah. You're right. You're right. I think that's an excellent point. And that's what Grace is struggling with at the, when we meet her, right? She's not whole and doesn't know how to be whole. So she's giving parts of herself to all of her different groups. So she's fragmented. Damn, that's such a good point. Motherfucker. <laughs> Motherfucker, Caitlin. It was Damn. right in front of your face. What the, the hell? Whole time. <laughs> That was so good. You're right. Morgan's going to be so proud of you. Kate. Yeah. Damn, you nailed it. <laughs> I feel like you just, because I had this yeah. in my head. I, I felt like she was segmented, but I never put it all together. Damn, you're right. I was right there at the nicknames. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, caffeinate for Caitlin, everyone. Just <laughs> Thank you. Holy shit. That was such a good point. Damn. Mm-hmm. All right, the discussion's over. What the? <laughs> no one's gonna talk about. Won the question. Won book club. Jesus. Okay. No, that was great. All right. So we kind of talked about this a little bit. Well, kind of touched on it when we were talking about the nicknames, but to dive a little bit deeper into like Grace's actual like blood relatives or family. So, what was your assessment of Grace's relationship with her father and her mother, and how did those dynamics? influence her life i guess i should preface this by saying to those who maybe haven't read the book um her parents separated when she was 13 her mother lived uh stayed in florida that's where grace originally grew up and then when they separated her father took her to portland and like basically raised her from then point on so like yeah her mom was gone a lot right like, yeah yeah okay. yeah so not a her, constant her mom I feel like- based- Go, 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 sorry. Um, because it was her mom's choice to be away, right? Mm-hmm. Mom was trying to find herself because, like, basically, mom was doing what Grace is doing, but her own yeah. version of that. She's like, I don't know who I am. I but need to figure that out, kind of thing. Grace growing up, Bristol, shut up. Sorry, dogs. Um, Bristol really loves book club. She did this last mm-hmm. time. <laughs> I feel like her mom choosing to be away affected her thinking that she was basically abandoned by her mom. So she wanted to keep the colonel happy no matter what, because maybe she was worried that he would also leave her. Totally. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That like abandonment trauma, essentially. Um, I think that the found family and and friends are where grace finds real like affection acceptance and actual love like tender the tender type of love Mm -hmm. the support and that those friendships are stable even if there's conflict but her relationships with her blood you know her mom and her dad were never stable because she was always afraid to lose the colonel's respect and approval. Um, Her mom was always going off uh, and away. So she lacked that stability with her actual family and had to find it elsewhere, which is sad and also the case for a lot of people. I'm sorry, I'm fighting a cat that's biting me. I have a dog next to me asking for pets. Uh, just because my brain is confused a little, Brie, are you on number four or three? Oh, I fucked up. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what you were saying was kind of relevant to three, but as soon as like she said blood, fa- blood yeah, family like, and all that, I was like, yeah, she's oh, on four. That was my bad. I'm sorry. I went down too far. That's my note idea. was mother, <laughs> mother. <laughs> Thank you, Caitlin. My notes on three are mother's incons- inconsistency caused a craving for stability and order. 
And the colonel's strictness and distance gave her stability, but also stiff ideas about what it means to succeed and affected the way Grace moves in society. And with her friends, and even affects the way that she relates to her friends. There's a passage in the book that I think sums this up really nicely. I think it's towards the beginning. She says, with Colonel's voice in her ears, urging her forward, she'd grappled to the top of this mountain, which is getting her PhD. Mom urged her to follow her dreams, so she chased the stars. She poured blood, sweat, and tears into her work, and here was the proof. Here was her vow of success to Colonel completed. So I think she had pressure to be perfect kind of from both parents but it was manifesting a little bit differently where the dad at the colonel is basically like be the best period end end of sentence and mom was like look be the best but like do what you want like follow your dream like not our dream kind of thing so again grace merged the two and that's where she's like phd astronomy and then when she gets the phd That's the vow to her father. Like you said, whereas mom's not really a factor anymore. It's more so about pleasing her dad, like you said. So that's probably from like the detachment from her mom kind of thing. Um, But the, I think the dad raising her and being military man, like imposed on her that toxic, rugged individualism that America is grappling with. Cause this takes place in, in the United States of America during this time period where this is a big problem. So because of that, Grace is always like, I have to solve like, like anytime her her friends are trying to point out to her, like take a break, slow down. She's like, no, 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 this is my problem. I'll solve it. I have to fix it. Like it's me, me, me. Like it's all about her, the individual, not like lean on your community when you can't like when you need help kind of thing. She's being forced into like, you have to have all the answers. You have to be the strong one. You have to be the dependable one. Cause like, That's what her dad's whole mentality is. That's army mentality. Like, so it imposed that toxic, rugged individualism on him. And, and I think that that lack of like having community in her own family, like really there's no better manifestation of that than the fact that she never calls her father dad. She calls him Colonel. Like when she was little, there's like language in the book where she's like, when I was young and I like fell off my bike or whatever, I called him dad. But like, I think after the separation, it was Colonel, 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 Colonel. Like, it it just, like, it's almost like she doesn't really have parents. She has, like, I don't know, people to please versus, like, people who support her for who she is kind of thing. Yeah. So I think that set her up for, like, making this whole mid-quarter life crisis thing she's going through even worse because she won't seek help. Like, she's just like, I have to figure it out. It's my problem. Like... And then she learns the hard way that she doesn't have the answers, like, you know? So I think that that, what her father imposed on her and the mom abandonment thing, it made her situation worse when she, like, fell into the current situation. Yep. It's, yeah. An, she's an island, in a way. Yeah, exactly. She is an island. Yeah. <sighs> okay, so now that we've talked about Grace and her relations with her blood relatives how does that compare to the relationship she builds with her found families and how is the theme of found family handled in general in the book um sorry the book shows that you can always rely on your found family to be there when you fall and will be waiting for you when you need them even if you've been gone for a while because they care yeah. about you and they love you. Found family is like one of the most important things in a person's life. And it especially, I think, applies to people in our community. Uh, yep. No matter what, um, what letter of the acronym you are, it, <clears throat> it it applies because you have you're part of a of a minority in society and so naturally you're going to seek out people who are like you or people who 
identi- you identify with and f- and have that connection a safe space you need a safe space and so that's what grace has in in this entire book is is showing you that found family is just as important as you know blood family and sometimes more so for some people it's all they have and that's one of the biggest things in this book that i find beautiful apart from the relationship with Grace and Yuki is the relationship with Grace and every other character. There's no character in here that I disliked. Even the Colonel, I didn't dislike him. I understood where this was coming from, but I was sad for Grace because of how he treated her. Found family is like, I would have died a hundred times over without the people that I found. The issue is that the colonel did do stuff that he thought was in her best interest, Mm -hmm. but he never explained to things. Like, walking out of the graduation, when he finally explained Mm -hmm. it to her, she understood completely. But he wasn't used to communicating, which is also probably why they got a divorce, by the way. Um, (laughs) Yeah, totally. So she didn't feel loved. Yeah. Yeah. He was, his expression of love was like, I did all the things to, like, make sure you had opportunities, but never gave her, like, affectionate support, which is the other facet of love. He's like, I did love through actions to make your life easier, but, like, never gave her, like, the emotional support. So she found that in other people, and that's, like, the found family part, like the like Baba Vihan's family like they're just like love and war- and like they're just affectionate and bubbly and they're like yeah we're here for you like whatever like little greasy and things like that so like that's like the family she never had that was like together and you know they went through their own thing with the mom and that family passed away and things like that but you know they were there and then like Yamena is just like She's like a pit bull in a way. She's like like cute and cuddly, like if you're on her good side, but then she will fiercely fight for you kind of person. And that's who Grace really needed because somebody in her corner that like is looking out for like her actual interests and like sees through her and like knows when she's like upset. And whereas the colonel, like there's no communication, like you said, Caitlin. So sometimes found family, like other people with different perspectives who come from different groups, like can offer different support than your own blood relatives who are have their own agendas to have their own problems going on and you know don't communicate well and i love that in general i love that morgan showed found family in different ways so it wasn't just like it's yeah it's a book about a queer character but it wasn't just like the queer group it was like just like again like baba vihan and mira and raj like they just adopted her as part of their family like you know and they like their co-workers but they're more than that and and like that's a found family in and of itself and then yuki had her own found family too so it goes to show you that like it's it's more of a universal thing for people especially you know people of color especially minorities in general because like a lot of those groups are minority based groups who mm-hmm. kind of band together or people of circumstance who band together like yamena grabbing agnes grabbing grace when grace was like struggling that's kind of what yamena did so I like that it manifests in different ways. And I love that she really put that into the book, that it's not just found family can manifest in many different ways, but at the end of the day, it offers support and love that people as like human beings need. Like it's a vital part of being human and it can manifest many ways. It's really special when you find it as well. Because mm-hmm. especially if you're not used to having people having like that. that around you. Totally, totally, totally. Um, and that's another reason why this book is now pretty much one of my favorites ever written. Because I have this thing where I will go look for queer books and I'm reading it for the queer content. But I read this book and I didn't read it for the queer content. I read it for the everything. And that's when I know that a book is really speaking to me and being and is special to me, because I will say this: the freaking, the writing, the prose, I can't say enough. And at the same time, 
I can't say anything because it's too awesome. <laughs> Morgan, write more books. <laughs> please. At your own pace because I yes, know how please. writing so, is. Yes, yes. Take your time, but please write other things because you're stupidly talented. Mm-hmm. All right. Speaking of the gay, let's talk about it. What is your assessment of Yuki and Grace's relationship and how it progresses from start to finish? Theo and Brie already got a taste of what I think. <laughs> Do you want to start or would you, you like to me to start? Yeah. Sure. I don't understand it. Um, I don't know. I feel like they should have been more concerned that they married someone and didn't know who they were and didn't really know how to contact them. And, you know... You mar- you're married. Find them quicker. It is weird that never once in the book are they ever like, we should probably annul this. <laughs> like, they never like... Yeah, no, it like, is weird. Like, I found it out before I talked to you, and then I ripped it up as soon as you contacted me. Like, Yeah, it's, it's kind of weird. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. It no, is I'm kind like, of like logically maybe weird. Maybe get but... annulled, then you can date. I mean, like, go okay. ahead, date if you That's want what I- to. That's but what like, I thought was going to happen in the book, and then it never happened. Then, and I was like, "All right, but okay, sorry, this is wrong with it." Then Grace right. just ghosts her for like, I don't even know how long in the book, and then the last three pages, the, everything is fine. Like the serious conversations that no one likes to put in. Like we need that because people just think everything's going to magically be okay. I agree. Okay, but. I will say this, everything was not okay. Like, they know everything's not okay, but they're going to try to work through it. That was the end of the book. We're going to try this, even though you you fucking ghosted me. I'm willing to give you another shot. That's what the ending was. It wasn't, we're happily ever after. This isn't Disney. (laughs) (laughs) No, I just hate when things, like, end in, like, the last few pages. Oh, I, I kind of love it. I love unresolved endings because I'm just that kind of person. I don't complete sentences. Then you can, like, think about where it goes. After that and also just Kaylin the... just wants the end. <laughs> See, I thought of something in my head, but it's gonna it's gonna sound bad. Why? Did they try to murder each other, Caitlin? <laughs> You're on the right <laughs> track! No! <laughs> I know. I know how your brain works. <laughs> Continue. I don't want to be like that, but um, okay. no, I thought like no, like the only un like open ending that I think I would like is if there was just a murder and like they're like <laughs> they go to, imagine they go back to the wedding. They're like, oh, you done it, done, 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 and then it comes. <laughs> yeah, like just like someone's dead. <laughs> you know what? No wonder I like little liars when I was younger. All the all the things in the back of the book could be like, I really didn't see that ending coming. <laughs> like seriously. Morgan, spoiler what the hell? alert. Spoiler. It was Grace's twin who murdered her. Oh my god. No, this isn't a soap opera. Stop it, Caitlin. Okay. <laughs> I was with you until we got there. Okay. Yeah. Um, I want to add something about the relationship. All your points are valid. Um, what I want to say is that I think that it's really significant in terms of their relationship, that Yuki is a complete stranger to Grace. Because when we meet Grace, again, Grace doesn't know who she is. She's spiraling out of control. She just goes to Vegas to, like, blow off steam and have fun, which is something she's never done, like, hasn't done probably in, like, a very long time. And is, like, you know when you're, like, yeah, this is, I'm gonna, this is gonna be great, best night ever, but you're, like, depressed and then drinking. And so, like, you're just, like, in a bad place so then she's like obviously that's not going well and then meets yuki who's just like fun and just sees grace as a fun human and sees grace not as like a phd student not as this like perfect porter or whatever she just sees her as a person with a personality and a beating heart and like fell in love with her for who she is really and i think that's the part grace can't get over because she keeps like bringing up the marriage thing she's like this person saw me and then decided to marry me like what did she see in me Because for Grace up to that point, like, she's just been seeking love from her father through accomplishments. And, like, Yuki doesn't know anything about her accomplishments. She's just like, I like you for you. Like, that's the probably the first time in a very long time that has happened for Grace, like, in a romantic way. And so 
for her, love was this quid pro quo thing. It's like, I do this, then I get your affection. I do this, I get your affection. But Yuki has no clue. She's just like, Yuki's just this beautiful woman that has this bubbly laugh she remembers. And Grace is like, I think I was having fun. I think I was happy. Like, what the fuck is this feeling? So I, she can't get over like the residual feelings that she had from that night from a stranger who really doesn't know her. So I, I love that it's a, yeah, it was like, I was, when I was reading it for the first time, I was like, this is a very weird trope to be in this book that I didn't really see coming. Cause I didn't read the back cover. I was just like, heard it's a great book from a friend of mine. I was like, I'll read it. But I was like, really? We're going to start with a Vegas wedding? But now having read it like and, and seeing Grace's journey and who Grace is, I think it it made sense for her because she was just a very tightly wound rubber band that snapped. And like, yeah, somebody in that position who's like flailing and is depressed and is drunk would do something like this where they're just like, fuck it, I'm having fun for the first time in forever. I never want this to stop. Let's get married, right? And and Grace, for a lot a lot of the time, she's like holding the key. They lock the keys on like the fake bridge or whatever oh, in yeah. Vegas. Yeah, and and clutches the key and always is, is like hesitant to tell people about it because she's like, this is mine. Like for for once, I did something for me that made me happy. It wasn't part of a plan. It was just for me. And so I think that it's so significant that Yuki is just a stranger who's not part of any of this, who saw Grace for just who she is not a set of accomplishment, not a doctor. And I think that's the thing that really stuck with Grace. And I think that's why she never really was like, let's end this because I've never had this. I kind of want to know what this is kind of thing. So I do like that. And they're both pretty mature actually about just like, let's, let's see where this goes. Like, it's never like weird. I mean, there's weird. Yeah. It's a little bit weird, but like, it's, it's not like the way they communicate and stuff is actually pretty good. It's just, when Grace spirals again, that's when it's because it's like Grace never at, went to New York to explore the thing with Yuki, but she never dealt with her actual problems. She just was running away. And so when it catches up to her and Yuki is the one at that point, who's like, listen, you came here to be happy. Like you found that you're a good teacher. Like, why don't you pursue that? And Grace, again, can't reconcile the path thing. She's like, no, no, no. Being a teacher is not the best. Working at NASA is the best. Like I can't, that's not the best. So I can't have these two things. Like I can't, I can't merge these things. And like Yuki can't get through to her because like Grace has to go has to like figure out who she is. Like that's the main problem. And so that's a punch in the gut though. It's she basically told Yuki that you're not the best for me. Yeah, exactly. Cause Grace is too it, she yeah, she's too much about Grace and is not I, seeing Yuki. Yeah. If I was Yuki, I'd be like, bye bitch. <laughs> no. I'm like, this is too like that nah. Um, well, also would have get an annulment right away. Just saying. <laughs> you also have to like take into account that this is we're we're at the love at first sight, love at first sight trope kind of thing, and this is like this is like imagine me and you without us being able to see the click. Yeah, you just get so, this hazy memory. Exactly, but that all to me makes it even kind of more attractive as a story because there's a, a veil of mysteries around it. And I think Grace needed that mystery and needed, needed the journey. So I, I but if you like, you look at them as characters, they're very good for one another because they have this mixture of differences and similarities at the same time. Um, and I just feel like Grace doesn't know how to love. And and Yuki doesn't know how to communicate with Grace about her, like, doesn't know how to get through to Grace. Because this is the part where they are fundamentally dif different and don't know each other on these levels yet. Yep. So, I don't, and I feel like the marriage thing, that happened, but I don't feel like it's as relevant to what they're doing afterwards. Yes. Because they are just dating, basically. They just are, they went about it backwards. This is what they did. Yeah, no, totally. Like, yeah, it's a little weird, but yeah, exactly what Bree said. But They're not if you like, your wife shut money. up and like get in the kitchen or whatever. It's nothing. It never gets weird, you know? Like, it's just like, that was the Yuki, catalyst for the meeting kind of thing. Yuki is a little weird and she needs to be to keep totally. Grace's attention and to, <laughs> I really think Grace loves that Yuki's a little, you know, out there yeah. because- all her stories 
like listening to that radio show, Yuki's radio show, I think that's when Grace first, first really starts being like knowing that she there's something really there. Like fundamentally, they meet each other on a level that transcends all of their differences. Um, and then I thought that despite getting married on the night they met, that their romance progressed really well. Like I like no, the pacing. I, totally. I agree. It's like an ass backwards thing, but like and yeah, like I, but it's I, genius in a way. Yeah. <laughs> Morgan! <laughs> I know. That's such a good story. All right. So speaking of the radio show, so what did you think of Yuki's Lonely Creatures radio show? And why do you think Grace and so many others are drawn to this program? Everyone feels alone. Everyone feels lost at some point in their life. No matter how many people you have around you, you feel like people don't see you. And that's, I think, what Yuki is doing is trying to throw out these threads for everyone that's listening. And that's why she says, are you listening? She's she's drawing the lost into, you know, pretty much her arms. It's like that show is like a hug to everyone who feels lost, alone and afraid. And that's, I think, another reason that Grace falls in love with with Yuki. Um her stories ha- appeal to appeal to everyone in there's something there for everyone in all the stories she tells because they're not just these weird stories of oddity and like science fictiony stuff. They're stories with these themes inside of them that can capture you and that's why her show is important not only to her but to Grace and everyone that hears it, like she's really, this is so important to her, to uh, any other person that may be like, this is just a little dinky radio show. To her, this is her helping people. This is her purpose, her connection to the world, her connection to her listeners is super important to her. And you see that when they go out in search of the, the creature and every and grace is kind of like okay what are we doing and you know her her friend her roommates just kind of know what's going on because they know yuki and this is grace grace's crash course in yuki is what that whole experience was but that shows you yuki's heart right there and what a magical person she is and why grace falls for her That was so well said. Do you have anything to add, Caitlin? I lost you guys. I found oh, no. you. Sorry. No, it's okay. Um, I said that tuning in every week gave people a sense of community. And that I hope it's something that we do as well. Are you guys listening? <laughs> Are you listening? Are you still awake? Are you still <laughs> it's been an hour. Wake up. Yeah, it's been an hour, guys. It's been an hour. Uh yeah. So I agree with I all that. <laughs> I agree with all that. Um coping with isolation and loneliness again is a universal human experience. The other thing I want to add that you guys haven't already talked about is the fact that she talks about monster stories. And I think that another thing to kind of pick apart there is she kind of talks about, I think she has conversations with Grace about this too, about these monsters. And it's like, is a monster inherently evil versus misunderstood? Mm-hmm. Because I think that's important when people feel lonely, isolated. It's like, am I the monster or am I misunderstood? So it's, it's another way people can kind of resonate. And I want to note that like, initially Grace is resist, the woman of science is resistant essentially to these stories. But it's really worth noting with Grace that the entire time like she's been chasing her astronomy dream she's been telling herself this story like she uses language in the book that like i'm made from the galaxy and like destined for greatness because of that so she's been like telling herself her own version of like a monster like fairy tale kind of story like yuki's been talking about but doesn't like she like 
it doesn't reconcile those two things that like I tell myself stories to make me happy but then Yuki telling stories is weird at first because I think she thinks that her story about the stars and the galaxies are more tangible because like the stars and the galaxy are real versus like these monsters that can't be real but like you said Brie the whole crux of it is that it's not really about monsters it's about connecting with people and like providing them like I guess love and support kind of that when people feel lonely because like the one person who's like hey no I saw this monster it's totally real and Yuki goes out of her way to go check it out because like if that person believes in it like it's important that I believe them too and like check it out that's like camaraderie with my like listeners so at the end of the day Grace gets it oh okay it's not really about believing in mythical things it's more about the community you build with the people with the shared interest thing so to Caitlin's point I hope you get that from this podcast too exactly all right so grace um throughout the book is basically in three different places in the united states she was in portland that's kind of where she grew up with the colonel since she was 13 there's new york which is where she goes to be with yuki for a bit and then she ends up in the grove in florida so how does her life in those three different areas compare and differ i got a short and to the point answer okay portland real life shit is hard new york pretend life only staying for summer like she didn't have any responsibilities or cares like she could just be with yuki and get to know her so it wasn't real life and then in the grove she resorted back to childhood and i feel like she needed to go back to because her childhood is when she was on that path so she needed to go back in that space to really find herself well said all right i have portland she has expectations and people she's used to being with people she knows um florida is where she's going to complete the chap this chapter of her journey because this is just we're getting a snapshot of her life just part of her life so this is this is that journey that we're going on with her this is kind of like the end of a journey that we see in florida where she's reestablishing her relationship with her mom she's learning how to just be and not move toward a goal all the time and the, a goal that's not even doesn't even really translate for her because the pinnacle of success is something different to every person and can be as versus what's the pinnacle of success in society because sometimes society is bullshit but hey whatever i mean most of it um, yes <laughs> yeah new york is that beginning of her finding who she is and who she is with yuki and who yuki is so that's just kind of really gets things going in new york and she actually has time time the thing she'd never had before to just experience she's the only thing she's experienced before this is going towards that goal and now she's like out in the wind in a way is basically what it is and whatever is coming she's experiencing so. Yes, yes, yes. I agree with everything you guys said. Portland, for me, that's where she moved with her dad. It's the setting of her anxiety. Like, Portland is just anxiety, responsibility. It's I the felt state. it. Yeah, like, you feel, like, when she's in Portland, you just, there's the anxiety. Mm -hmm. Like, that's where the plan started. The plan is falling apart. This is just anxiety so like grace needs to get the fuck out of there yes the grove is this simple isolated place it's, it's down to earth right literally the earth literally right? the earth yeah literally it's where she as a child was like she when she remembers the grove like not even before she gets there she remembers it she, she talks about how like she, when she was there she used to just climb trees and just like watch like she had time because she was a child with no expectations there she could just sit at the top of these trees and smell orange blossoms and like watch the harvest and just like 
exist without anxiety. So like she remembers the grove fondly when she thinks about it, not when she's physically there. But then when she goes back at the end, it's a reconnection to her roots, like you said, Caitlin, because she has to reconcile who she is as an adult with responsibilities because you cannot run away from them. You have to unfortunately deal with them. That's why being an adult sucks. But she's trying to reconcile that from when she was happy as a kid with no expectations, right? So like she has to go back there to complete the cycle of like, how do I reconcile happiness and being an adult, right? And so the middle road is New York City, which is the complete opposite of Grace's plan, New York City, right? It's this brand new environment where Grace is initially super uncomfortable, right? Because being in a new environment where you don't know how to navigate it is scary, right? She even says to Yuki a few times, like, says like, oh, um, she scolds Yuki for walking to the radio station alone at night because she's like, it's dangerous here. And like, because like, it's a new place. It's scary. Like I've heard, I've heard whispers of like dangerous people and stuff. And Yuki's like, I've been living here for years. Like it's fine. So it's an inner monologue of like Grace just being afraid of being in a new environment. But over time, like New York city kind of becomes this safe haven for her a little bit. Like the apartment itself, Yuki's roommates, she starts bonding with them, right? The recording studio, they become familiar places because she's like on her own navigating a new place and like finding her own like role in that new environment. So it's it's showing grace that like, Hey, when you step out of your comfort zone, when you go onto a new path that you have to pave for yourself, you are capable of navigating this by yourself. You just have to like breathe a little, give yourself a chance. And also like she has people supporting her, right? Yuki and the roommates and all that stuff. And I think it's really significant. The impact that like this transition place has on her, because when she goes to the Grove later, the first thing she notes when she's trying to sleep is the absence of New York city. Like she's like, there's no, I don't hear the heartbeat of the city. I don't hear like the street noises, like the sound of life and opportunity. Like she recognizes that like, I can't escape to my childhood. I miss that place that was new. That was mine that I was navigating. So I think it's more than just like Yuki herself. It's like symbolizing grace, like needing to get out of her comfort zone and go experience a new place. Um, Initially, I think she she viewed New York as running away um, so that she can focus on like what made her happy and clear her head, like you were saying, Brie. But I think that it really became more than that. It became like the stepping stone of like, I can, I am capable of like moving past this like broken path right now and carving my own in a new scary place I'm not familiar with. And like the other thing I think she learns too here is that like, I can, it's okay to let other people take care of me. Because I think that's the other part of grace where like, again, that toxic individuality that she has where she's like, I have to navigate this. But in New York, she doesn't. She has Yuki to guide her around. The roommates are there to like greet her at the end of the day. So it's like, she learns to lean on other people and that it's okay to like be in a new environment, basically. So I think I like the way Morgan did that by like putting the character in physical, different physical locations that are starkly that are very different from each other too like new york city is very different than portland which is very different than like southern florida (laughs) you know so it sets a good stage in like grace's transition and like the full circle that she goes through boy are they different hell yeah yeah. (laughs) all right so what did you guys think of the representation in this story? Beautiful. A plus plus. Even the side characters felt like they were flesh and bone. Like you could grab a hold of them and just like experience them. That's rare for me with books because usually a lot of side characters or, you know, supporting characters feel two dimensional. And these did not because I wanted to be friends with them. <laughs> And I'll um, never be friends with them because they're not real. I know. They're real in your head. That's what right. the psychiatrist said. <laughs> <laughs> I heard it. Um, I thought it was very diverse and educating on different cultures. It was um, never really discussed in the book, except like when they were playfully joking around with each other. And I really like the scene with Grace and I think Dorian when they were doing like the protective hairstyles because oh, yeah. that's something that um, unless you are in that 
culture. I don't know the right way to say it. Um, but you don't understand that. So it's mm -hmm. educating people who don't know that. Well, it's, it's giving... Uh, the thing about this book is that the representation is there, but one, it's not shoehorned. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly natural. Two, you get pieces of so many different cultures and also uh, sexuality and gender. Queer identities and yeah. Queer identities. I like... <clears throat> I think yeah. what the character, one of the characters that really interested me, um, was Sonny. Mm -hmm. I want to know more. Like I want their journey. Yeah, totally. I just I want to know. <laughs> like that, I just I want a book about Yuki's life before. Seriously, Yuki's whole <laughs> family is incredible. Yeah. I want I those are my favorites. I want a book about Agnes, Jimena, and Mira. Yeah, no, that, that would too. be amazing. Oh my god, that would be amazing. Can, can there just be like a trilogy I know. of these books? We're like deciding Morgan's life right now. I'm That's sorry. <laughs> this is we'll, binding. We'll step off. <laughs> no, but really, uh, it, like it's off the charts, just the representation in general. So again, there's a ton of different cultures and the way she writes it is just, it's, fleshing out the character and it's it i love the way she does it in really subtle ways like when they're in the tea room and talking kind of about the tea and you can you get the sense of like mira's culture like from how their conversation it's it's not again this like shoehorn thing uh brie like you were saying and like it's just it's natural conversations that like flesh out their cultures that flesh out who these people are their values and things like that it makes them people right because they are and and i love that she has a variety of different cultures and like people of color in this book and the way she wrote them all was just so masterful. There's so many queer identities in this. And the other part I want to talk, I think is worth mentioning is there's different family structures throughout this book too. Like you have, you know, step parents, you have the Mira's family with the, with the mom passed away. You have like you men or, you know, really talk about their family. And like Yuki never talks about her family. They just, they have their friend family. And so it just goes to show you like, you know, humanity in different manifesting in different forms. And I think it's so beautiful the way she did it. Everything is very natural. So it's just, it's the best representation I've ever seen in a book. Like it's me too. Just, it's incredible. It's so good. I just want to make every white person I know read it. It's so good. It's yeah, it's so good. I All right. It. I love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. So that brings us, so that concludes our discussion. But before we sign off, how much big gay energy does this story have on the lesbian Jesus hydration scale? You go first, Caitlin. Okay. So what I have written, you're going to hate me. <laughs> no, we're not. Five. That's fine. Okay. Um, but over the course of talking and making myself get out of the headspace of the main relationship, I decided to give it an eight for representation in general. That's fair enough. Totally. Yeah. It actually yeah. went from five to six to seven to eight in the past 15 minutes. That's amazing. The power of Morgan. <laughs> Yes, exactly. The power mm -hmm. of representation as well. Yeah. Yeah. I yep. will go next since the or this is the Aura's book, so she should go last. And mine is the infinity of a black hole <laughs> cups of water. <laughs> she gets the Milky Way. <laughs> no, seriously. If we had to do it on a scale of one to ten, I'm getting giving it a ten. But ten, uh and ten. Bree's answer is perfect. <laughs> Literally a black hole. Like it's it, the the limit does not exist. Honestly. I mean, it works for this book as well. Yeah, it, that's exactly. What she said it. Yeah, <laughs> no. no perfection. Honestly, this has some of the best representation. Period. Like, th there's more than one queer character. They are all handled really well. The representation. Period. The writing. The journey. Like, 
ten, this if you seriously if you haven't read this book and you're just listening to us please go read this book it's really an easy read it's it's fantastic. it's not that long either it's really not that long it's like 200 it's 200 pages like honestly like it's really not that long 250 i think i finished like, it in like four days because i read yeah. half and half yeah, yeah like you, you're you stuck in this. an airport read it read it morgan's it's like a beautiful writer it's phenomenal. the most delicious you know dessert you could ever have start your 2023 off right and go check out this book if you haven't already but that doesn't mean we're done with book club 2023 just started and next up we have a breeze pick brie what are we reading next month next so for february girls of paper and fire Here is the uh, synopsis for you. Each, each year, eight beautiful girls are chosen as paper girls to serve the king. It's the highest honor they could hope for and the most demeaning. This year, there's a ninth, and instead of paper, she's made of fire. In this richly developed fantasy, Lei is a member of the paper cast, the lowest and most persecuted cast of people in Ikara. She lives in a remote village with her father, where the decade-old trauma of watching her mother snatched by royal guards for an unknown fate still haunts her. Now the guards are back, and this time it's Lay thereafter, the girl with the golden eyes, whose rumored beauty has piqued the king's interest. Over weeks of training in the opulent but oppressive palace, Lay and eight other girls learn the skills and charm befit to befit a king's consort. There, she does the unthinkable. She falls in love. Her forbidden romance becomes enmeshed with an explosive plot that threatens her world's entire way of life. Lei, still the wide-eyed country girl at heart, must decide how far she's willing to go for justice and revenge. Ooh, intriguing. So, get ready, because it's a ride, and this is actually a trilogy. Uh, it is and but the first book in my mind almost stands on its own in a way as far as like if this is the only one you read you'll be okay but I love 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 the romance in this there's just a lot of trigger warnings guys it it starts in at like page 13 or something just FYI so trigger warnings for SA, trigger warnings for bad things happening to animals. So if that's not something you're into, you can skip, skip the you skip, skip the animal those parts part. of the book. <laughs> yeah. It's not hard to skip. You just pop right over it. But yeah. All right. So we have girls of wait, girls of fire, girls of paper of fire. fire. Girls of- Yes. Girls of Paper and Fire. Thank you. Girls of Paper and Fire to look forward to next time. So thank you for joining us for our our inaugural 2023 book club. We'll see you guys next month. Bye. 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 And with that, we've been Big Gay Energy. If you like this episode, check out all our other episodes right here on YouTube. Please like, leave a comment below, and subscribe for more amazing super gay content. If you'd like to support us, check out our merch store, or join our Patreon for early access to episodes, exclusive content, and so much more. Until next time, stay safe and hydrate for lesbian Jesus.